Hello, I'm Brian. Welcome to my photo show. Today's topic, the various models of Nicromat. What were they? What are the differences? Um, there were eight different Nicromat models produced between 1967 and 19, excuse me, 1965 and 1977. Um, three electronic, five mechanical. So we're going to dispense with the three electronics real quick. Don't buy one. They have notoriously glitchy and unreliable electronics and they continue to drain battery power even when in the off position um, such that in order to save the battery you really need to remove it at the end of the day if you haven't finished your film well that's a problem in the electronic necromats because of the incredibly foolish battery placement to change the battery in electronic this is not an electronic necromat this is an FTN but just for demonstration purposes in order to change the battery in the electronic nicromat, you have to remove the lens to expose the, um, the light box, flip the mirror up, like so, excuse me, flip the mirror, here we go, flip the mirror up, and then there was a, a little latch down here in the bottom of the light box where you would flip it open and, um, and remove the battery or insert the new battery. Well, that is the absolute worst possible place for a battery. The light box is the last place you want to be messing around inside of an SLR. Um, the, the, the danger of, of um, messing something up, getting dust and dirt in there, or accidentally touching the shutter. Um, it, it, it's, it's just a foolish place for a battery. Uh, they have, uh, they have um, uh, unreliable electronics. Avoid the electronic knocker mats. That is the knocker mat EL. ELW and EL2, although technically known as the Nikon EL2, it was essentially a Nicromat. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't buy one. If you've inherited one, by all means, spend your money on lenses instead uh, if it works, but I would not invest in one. Okay, so the, the mechanical Nicromats. This is an FTN and this is an FT2. I'm going to start with the FTN. This is not the first Nicromat model introduced. The FTN was introduced in 1967 and produced until 1975. Uh, about a million of these things were made. This is the most numerous and popular Nicromat model. It is the most readily available on the second-hand market today. They're very inexpensive, very easy to find. Um, it was preceded by the, uh, the FT and the FS. So the difference between the FTN and the FT and FS has to do with metering okay the original ft in addition to the the ordin the nicromats are kind of quirky cameras and i've done a separate video on that sort of talking about the uh the unusual little characteristics that make these things so fun and keep them so cheap um, but in, in addition to all of that the ft required that you reset the asa each time you change lenses so uh, the the uh, the FTN and the, FT, and the FT2 had a certain method of, of setting the maximum aperture. Um, I've done a video on that about how to remove and, and, um, uh, and replace a, uh, a pre-AI lens on a Nicromat. Um, on the FT, the procedure was a little bit different because you had a, a scale on this side around the, uh, the, uh, the lens mount whereby you had to match up the um, film speed to the maximum aperture and you had to do that manually uh, and you had to do that every time you changed a lens uh, so that was kind of a hassle having to reset the ASA and re-index it to the maximum aperture manually every time you changed a lens the um, the FTN improved on that somewhat um, that is we'll see that video and imagine a process that's even even more complicated than, than, than the one described um, so the FTN fixed that. In addition, the FT had a light meter which utilized full field averaging. That is, the light meter did not distinguish between the amount of light coming in from the sides or the corners or the center of the image. The FTN uh, introduced the uh, center weighted pattern, the, the famous Nikon center weighted pattern whereby 60% of the meter sensitivity is, co is concentrated in a 12 millimeter circle in the center of the field which is marked. Um, it's a great system, in my opinion. It's, it's the best metering pattern um, uh, prior to electronic uh, multi-pattern matrix metering. Uh, it works great and um, 
uh, and um, I'm not a fan of full field averaging. The, the, the center weighted, particularly the Nikon center weighted system, gives you the ability to, um, to measure exposure uh, much more accurately and reliably. So those are a couple of big differences between the FT and the FTN. The other model introduced in 1965 was the FS. The FS was merely an FT without a light meter. So the FS, um, the meter coupling was not an issue, the battery was not an issue, it was simply a, a, a meterless uh, nichromat. Nowadays, the FS is worth more than either the FT or the FTN because there weren't very many of them made. It was not particularly successful. Uh, not many of them were sold, and so today they are sought after by collectors. So the meterless FS is actually worth more on the collector market than, than this or the, or the FT. Um, of course, for, for the shooter, there's no practical difference between an FTN or an FT with a non-functioning light meter and an FS. Uh, no difference whatsoever in, in terms of how you would use the camera. So you know, from a shooter's perspective, there's no advantage to the FS. It's strictly a collector's camera nowadays, and the FT suffers from some additional quirks regarding the metering pattern and method of, of uh, mounting and removing the lens and, uh, and uh, uh, indexing the maximum aperture to the ASA, which is a bit clumsy and awkward and cumbersome. So, and in addition, the, the FT has a little bit of collector appeal because it was the first sort of, you know, prosumer Nikon and it was made in much smaller numbers than the FTN. So the fact that it was the very first you know, non-professional Nikon um, and its limited production run keeps the prices of the FT on par, if not in excess, of the FTN. Bottom line, the FS and the FT can pretty much be forgotten by, the, um, uh, by a, a photographer today if you're looking to shoot. If you're looking to collect, that's different. But if you're looking to shoot, your best bargain is going to be the FTN in terms of price um, and features with regard with, with respect to the um, uh, its predecessors, the FT and FS. Um, so the FTN, very popular, easily available, highly recommended, um, and um, uh, it's a great a great platform upon which to build your Nikon system. Um, the the uh, successor to the FTN was the FT2, and it differed in a few respects. So you notice here on top of the FTN, there's no um, uh, there's no hot shoe. There was uh, an accessory attachment that clipped on and, and screwed in, screwed in place around the eyepiece. Um, that was a cold shoe attachment, where, so whereby you could attach accessories to the FTN, uh, but it did not provide an electrical pulse to to fire your flash. Um, as it would if it were a hot shoe. That's the difference between a hot shoe and a cold shoe. A hot, a hot shoe has, excuse me, a hot shoe, don't want it, has that electrical contact right there, which is going to send a pulse to the, the flash to tell it to fire. Cold shoe does not have that. Um, the other difference between the FTN and the FT2, um, the, one of the most awkward aspects of the, the Nichromats is the method of setting ASA. I mentioned the, the, uh, um, the manual method on the FT. On the FT, and it was improved, but still kind of awkward. You had to turn this, uh, this bracket right here to set the ASA. The bracket on, on this particular model is a little stiff. On some other models, it's loose. Um, so it just depends on, on the luck of the draw, which, whether your bracket is going to be stiff or loose or you know, just right. And um, the complaint at the time was sometimes these things could be knocked out of alignment um, inadvertently. So that was fixed on the FT2 by with, with this thing the, right here. I don't know how well you can see this. But this tab pulls out. And if you, when you pull out this tab, I don't know how well you can see that on the video, but anyway, if you pull out this tab, it then frees up the bracket. And I put the tab back in, and now the bracket is, is, um, is fixed. So I pull the tab out move the bracket, set my ASA, put the tab back in, and it is now set. Okay, so that's actually easy. I mean, it all looks pretty awkward as I'm doing it here, but um, that is an improvement. Uh, setting the ASA on this thing is, is can be a little frustrating. 
um, the the um, the bracket on this particular model is a little tight, and, and it's easy to overshoot, and um, and if you <laughs> um, and it's uh, anyway. Um, no other manufacturer ever made a camera with a similar method of setting ASA, and that, that says a lot. So, uh, the other major do advantage between the, the, the update um, uh, containing the FT2 was the battery. The FTN and the FT preceding it took a mercury battery, which um, produces 1.3 volts or 1.35 volts. The FT2 takes a silver oxide or alkaline battery producing 1.5 volts. You can't get mercury batteries anymore. There are some workarounds. I'm not going to talk about all those. Um, you can Google you know, mercury battery solutions or mercury battery workarounds. Um, there are a number of those out there. But suffice to say, some people think that's an issue on the FTN. Others say, well, you know, they put the mercury battery in and it really doesn't make that much of a difference. But you, know, you decide for yourself how important that is. Um, but on the FT2, it's just plain not an issue because it was, it was um, designed to take um, 1.5 volt batteries that are easily available today. Um, all right, that covers the major, oh, one, one more major difference. So inside the viewfinder of the FTN versus the FT2, on the FTN, the viewfinder focusing aids were a microprism spot surrounded by a ground glass field. On the FT2, that was updated to include a split image rangefinder in the center surrounded by a microprism collar on a ground glass field. A lot of people like the split image focusing aid um, and have trouble with if you, you just have a microprism dot. It's not that hard. Um, I do like the split image better, me personally, but I can get by with the microprism dot. It's not, it's not that bad. Uh, but some people are really ha have trouble with just the microprism dot and really want the, uh, the split image rangefinder. Um, some of the later uh, samples of the FTN did have the split image rangefinder. Most did not, but a few of the of the later production FTNs did, um, and all the FT2s did. So if you're buying an FTN, clarify from the seller whether or not the focusing aid includes a um, a split image rangefinder. Um, uh, focusing aid as, as well as the microprism collar, uh, if that's of interest to you. Um, okay, so the next model after the FT2 was the FT3. And the FT2 and the FT3 were identical except for the method of meter coupling. The FT2, as you can see here, is a pre-AI camera. That is, it meters by coupling the uh, metering pin to the metering prong, the old-fashioned way. Nikon updated this method in 1977 um, to use a tab instead of a pin. I've done a separate video on... Um, I'm going to do a separate video on... I don't think I did a video about that. Well, never mind. So, um, the cameras made after the, uh, the Nikromats had a tab instead of that pin. Um, and uh, oh, I did a separate video on lens compatibility where I talked about the tap and the pen. That's what, okay. Um, and the, um, the pre-AI, older pre-AI lenses like this one cannot be mounted on a post-1977 Nikon without modification, uh, with the exception of a few cameras that had um, um, a retractable AI tab. Bottom line, the Nikromat FT2 and the FT3 are identical except for the meter coupling method. The FT2, in my opinion, is the, pro is the better choice because, the, um, uh, because of its ability to accept and meter at full aperture with pre-AI lenses. So the pre-AI lenses sell for a slight discount, well sometimes a considerable dis discount depending upon which lens and which focal length we're talking about. Um, but the pre-AI lenses do sell for a discount. And so that's one of the main advantages of the FT2 and, and the FTN, in my, in my opinion. Uh, the, that is your ability to use pre-AI lenses. Um, I wrote an essay on this topic, which was published in Emulsive. I will link to that down below. I go into a little bit more detail and explain a little better than I can here on the video. Um, suffice to say that the, the FT3 has, in my opinion, no advantage over the FT2 uh, because it cannot accept... Well, it can accept pre-AI lenses because it has a folding tab, but it cannot meter at full aperture. You have to use stop-down metering 
for pre-AI lenses on a uh, on an FT3, just as you would an FM. An FM also has the retractable tab, uh, which can accept the pre-AI lenses, uh, but use a stop-down metering method. The FT2, excuse me, the F the FM2 does not have that tab. That was eliminated by then by uh, by the time the FT2 was introduced. Excuse me, the FM2 was introduced. Um, so there's no advantage to the FT3 over either the FT2 or the FM, in my opinion. But if you if you can find one for cheap, it's a great camera. I love my FT2. Um, it's, um, it's it's just a wonderful camera. It's easy to use. Um, and ever since I got this thing, my FM has been gathering dust on a shelf. Um, these are not expensive cameras, and they're very capable, uh, and they're they're just utterly indestructible. So those are your five models of um, electric, excuse me, mechanical nicromats, beginning with the FT, which had the full field averaging and the awkward system of setting the ASA and the maximum aperture manually um, each time you change lenses. The FS, the meterless version, which is popular with collectors and doesn't make sense for a shooter because you're going to overpay for a meterless camera. Uh, this, the FTN, my personal recommendation because they are the most easily available and the least expensive. Um, followed by the FT2, which offers a, um, um, a handful of improvements which may be meaningful to you, although these do sell for about maybe twice the price of these. Um, right now, a Nicromat FTN will, will run you maybe 40 or $50 in really top condition, whereas one of these, an FT2, will, you'll pay maybe 80 bucks for uh, an FT2 in really top-notch condition um, and an FT3 would be, runs for about the same price as the FT2. So FT, FS which preceded the FTN, FTN most popular model followed by the FT2 which was produced for, uh, for two years from 75 to 77. Roughly 200,000 or so of these things were sold opposed to about a million of these. Um, this contains uh, a few improvements over the FTN. Oh, another improvement I didn't mention. The FTN is a brick. This thing weighs, I think, 950 kil uh, kilometers, um, um, grams, 950 grams, empty, uh, no lens. Whereas the FT2 uh, is about 200 grams lighter. So this is, a, it's, a, it's the same size, it's just um, lighter than the FTN. Uh, which, which I prefer. I mean, this is a heavy camera. This thing's a brick. Um, so a slightly, li slightly lighter weight in the FT2, uh, which was then followed by the FT3, which is identical except for the meter coupling method. Okay, that is a rundown of the various models of Nicromat. I hope that was not too confusing. Take a look at the article I wrote in Emulsive. Um, I also have a book out, self-published book, called um, Nikon Film Cameras, Which One is Right for You? Uh, check out the link below, available on Amazon, $3 worth of knowledge, guaranteed. And um, I've got a link below for some, some uh, cool analog merchandise that I, uh, of my own creation as well. So please have a look at that stuff. Hope you enjoyed the video. See you next time. Bye-bye.